Okay, uh, welcome to the first uh, technical exchange meeting for our ASAP Center. So here we're trying to develop the transformative technologies together with our industry partners for the future dimension performance and also functionality scaling of electronics. Um, so my name is Ching Chao. Uh, I'm a faculty with the Mature Science and Engineering Department at UIUC, and I'm also the Associate Director for the ASAP Center. So I'd like to uh, first uh, thank all of our industry participants. The purpose of today's meeting is really to introduce our research portfolio to the industry and your feedback will be really critical for us to upgrade our research themes and topics, which finally we hope would be interesting enough. So your company and organization would participate in the center as our members, and also you will be able to join our center as advisory board members. Um, so the theme of uh, today's meeting is about uh, material discovery for next generation electrical and photonic interconnects. So we will discuss three interesting ideas from our participating faculty members. Uh, each presentation will be 15 minutes. The Q&A from industry members will follow at the end of the three presentations. All the presentations will be recorded and distributed to industry member with permission from the PIs. And today is the first technical exchange meeting. We will have two additional ones with focus on the heterogeneous integration as well as the neuromorphic circuits and architectures. They're gonna happen in the next two months. But what's more importantly is we're gonna have the in-person workshop in April. So we do hope to see you there. The workshop would involve participants from industry companies, national labs, and also federal agencies. And we do need your support at the workshop in April so we can establish the center with both industry and government funds. So we will start from the first presentation in today's technical exchange meeting, where we will talk about what we proposed to form perfectly ordered nanoparticles locate dielectrics using a kind of novel three-dimensional top-down lithography method. And the target is to achieve dramatically improve the material dielectric and the mechanical properties at the same time. So our team for this topic is composed of two faculty members here at UIUC, including myself, and also my collaborator, Professor Pingfeng Wang. Pingfeng is an associate professor in the Department of Industrial and Enterprise System Engineering. So here we combine our expertise on material science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and also system failure analysis to develop the next generation locate dielectrics for high performance microelectronics. So we're gonna start from the problem statement. It has been well recognized that the parasitics associated with the device interconnect structure has been a critical bottleneck, limiting the performance of our microprocessor chips, and they could actually account for 40% of the total delay and energy consumption of our current microprocessors. For chip interconnect, specifically the parasitic capacitance formed between interconnect lines is a critical contributor towards the overall RC time constant. And we know since the 19 nanometer technology nodes, the locate dielectrics, which is in the form of nanoporous organosilicate glass, has been introduced by the industry to replace silicon dioxide as the interlayer dielectric to mitigate this problem. Currently, such nanoporous silicon di dioxide film, we dope it with also carbon and hydrogen, they have a porosity in the range from about 20 to 30%. And they're going to be able to achieve an effective dielectric constant down to about 2.45 instead of the R chips. However, to support the fuller scaling, which is in terms of the performance of this dielectric material, we need the K value to become smaller than two. And this is a very challenging target. It will be very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve with current nanoporous organosilicate glass dielectrics for several reasons. Well, so first of all, in current locate dielectrics, we have this random power structure generated by the release of pyrogen species 
under the thermal treatment during the chemical vapor deposition process. Now, since air inside those nanopores, they have low dielectric constant of one, so it helps to reduce the effective dielectric constant of the whole material composite. Therefore, the achievable dielectric constant, in this case, is largely determined by the degree of the film porosity. So if we want to further reduce the K value from 2.45 down to below two, as our target in this case, it means we need to further increase the film porosity. However, it will be very difficult for such random power structure as the porosity is theoretically limited by the percolation threshold. So mathematically, the percolation threshold for a four coordinate system is only 57%, which means if the porosity actually goes above this threshold value, well, the original kind of long range connectivity of such random system cannot be maintained and therefore the structure gonna collapse. So it will get the film porosity kind of back below the percolation threshold. And the second problem is, in addition to this theoretical performance limit regarding the porosity level, another practical concern here is the mechanical strength and the electrical reliability. Right, so here for this interlayer dielectrics, first of all, they must have sufficient mechanical strength because we need to make sure they're compatible with the chemical mechanical polishing or CMP process. And also they need to have very good reliability to support the product lifetime. But for this random power structures, right, the further increase of the porosity level will inevitably lead to the more prevalence of certain weak spots in the material structure as shown in the simulation. And those weak spots will limit both the mechanical strength and also the electrical reliability of the thin film. So then the question is how we will be able to overcome these limitations. Right, so one possible solution is to go from a random power structure to a perfectly ordered power structure. Right, so in this case, the porosity will not be limited by the percolation threshold since we're not dealing with a random system. Moreover, in this case, right, the mechanical and electrical stress will be uniformly applied to the whole structure. So the actual mechanical strength and the electrical reliability will be dramatically improved. Since the weak spots causing the material catastrophic failure will be largely eliminated. And scientifically, an interesting question is to understand using this perfectly ordered power structure as a good platform about the correlation between the composite material dielectric properties and the geometric arrangement of those pores. So the target is to generate a design tool that will be able, be able to allow us to design the material in the first space and understand this type of material with the structure and properties we actually need for dielectric applications. So now the big question is like, how are we gonna be able to form such ordered power structure in three dimension? Right, so one obvious approach is to go from bottom up assembly. Right, so here we can do it based on materials like metal organic frameworks or MOF material. There are some existing works in this direction, but the problem with MOF is they have very complicated stoichiometry and their synthesis requires not only high temperature, but also in many cases, high pressure. So they're not compatible with the back end of line integration process at all. The metal ions and these organic linkers in these MOF molecules, they may not be actually compatible with the silicon CMOS, CMOS technology. And also for the MOF material, we also have very limited design space regarding the size, the shape, and the arrangement of those nanopores. So the kind of like crazy idea we have over here is, well, whether it will be possible for us to define this regular power structure using high throughput top-down lithography. And it's actually possible based on a process we developed over here at UIUC, so we call it as the proximity field nanopatterning. So how does it actually work? All right, so here we have a face mask featuring periodical arrays 
of relief structures based on elast elastomers, such as PDMS. And the PDMS mask can then be conformally applied on the wafer surface coated with the photoresist. So now we shine the light, let the light pass through the PDMS face mask, and the PD PDMS face mask is in conformal contact with the solid photoresist film. So in this case, the light will diffract into separate beams at a location far away from the, ma the mask surface. And here the number and the distribution of the diffracted beams, as you can imagine, gonna depend on the geometry of the relief structure on the mask and also on its optical properties like the index of refraction. But what's important is that for the locations like pretty near the surface of the mask, or in another word, in the proximity region, at the interface with the photoresist, those diffracted beams, they're gonna spatially overlap and interfere with one another. So we're gonna form a pretty complex 3D distribution of intensity. And it's gonna expose the photoresist and after develop, generates pretty complex three-dimensional power structures as shown in our preliminary data. It is a high throughput single exposure process to generate this regularly power structure in 3D and the pattern generated, including the pore size and the pore structure, it depends on the geometry of the relief structure on the mask and also the process conditions. And therefore they can be controlled and adjusted. So the mechanism here is based on the well-known Talbot effect. The characteristic lens of the 3D structure generated is the Talbot distance and it scales with the periodicity of the face mask as well as the wavelengths of the incident light. This process is also compatible with two photon process. So we'll be able to generate structures with better contrast as demonstrated in previous works. So here by using HSQ or PMSQ as the photoresist, then we will be able to generate such patterns with silicon dioxide as the backbone. So for example, in this case, we can generate a structure with porosity up to 57%. And based on the simulation, it will give an effective dielectric constant down to 1.6. So it's below the target of two. And at the same time, we're also gonna maintain a pretty high Young's modulars of 31 gigapascal. So that's only three times lower compared to bulk silicon dioxide. So these properties make it very attractive to meet the performance requirement we have for the low-key dielectrics for not only interconnects, but also for chip packaging. And in addition to this kind of interstacking structure, we can also form hexagonal lattice as well as the wood pile structures by using different face masks. And such design flexibility gave us the capability to find the optimum structure which kind of balance the dielectric and the mechanical properties. And based on this preliminary data, the major question we want to answer in this project is what about the scalability of this proximity field nano patterning? Right, so the pore size generated using the UV light as we demonstrated in our previous work is about several hundred nanometers. So this pore might be good enough as low-key dielectrics for chip packaging, but they're way too big for interconnects. By reducing the pattern periodicity and the wavelengths of the incident light down to about 10 nanometer, the question is, will we be able to generate pores with size down to a few nanometers? So to answer this question, we will define the face masks using the 150 kilo EV e-beam lithography system we just acquired here at UIUC, and also using the EUV lights generated at the advanced photon source at the nearby Argonne National Lab to expose the HSQ-based photoresist. After exposure, the formed 3D nanostructures as well as the film's dielectric and mechanical properties will be fully characterized. So the target is to establish the technological feasibility of forming the perfectly ordered power dielectric by proximity field nano patterning as the next generation low-key dielectrics for microelectronic applications. The other major target in this project is to establish a simulation platform so we can perform simulation guided material design for porous locate dielectrics. And my collaborator, Ping Feng, will cover this part. Okay, thank you, Chin. 
Um, <clears throat> as Ching has uh, explained earlier, that the different ways of uh, uh, fabricating uh, the aligned, you know, the microstructure of the of the materials. And one question is, is that how these different designs related with the performance of the material, for example, the mechanical thermal and dielectric properties, if we're exploring different designs, then the, uh, the way to find out the, <clears throat> the material property must be very efficient. So this is where the, uh, the simulation work can come in here. For example, if to investigate the mechanical property of different uh, the micro uh, nanostructures of the material can develop these uh, continuum scale models and uh, to uh, by assuming the you know homogenized material properties or we can go a step further to develop these atomic scale, scale models to investigate these uh, uh, the uh, the interactions of uh, energetic ions in different constitutive elements related to the design of materials using a set of interatomic potentials in the materials design space. And uh, similarly, we could uh, also apply the same strategies to investigate the thermal properties, uh, uh, such as the thermal conductivity by developing different levels of con computational models. Uh, to also investigate the dielect simulations, we could use the the uh, effective median theory to give a very quick approximate and uh, such as the uh, the clauses uh, Mossadi relation that is good for the low K porous materials. Alternatively, we could uh, develop models to solve the 3D Laplace equation with the three Feynman, uh, Feynman difference methods and with material properties such as the uh, polarizability for individual constituent elements being determined by the autonomous simulations, then we could uh, uh, you know, find out the, the property such as the dielectric constants. Here we could use the representative volume elements like RVE method to link different scales of the computational models in, the, uh, in pre, uh, predicting this, uh, the material design. So essentially we have a different ways to generate data. For example, we fabricate the samples through experiments and also using simulation models as a different, with different fidelity and uh, uh, to simulate the material property. The essential question would be, how do we use this information effectively to guide the material design? And knowing that all the information would come with a cost. So, and particularly in the design space uh, exploration phase, so how do we effectively, you know, the managing the computational effort and the experimental effort. So in the next slide, we will explain that how do we integrate the physics of failure modeling, uh, you know, to predict material properties and also machine learning accelerate failure identification technique to accurately predict the reliability performance. For example, if we consider the, uh, the time-dependent dielectric breakdown with the nanoprocess material, we could build this uh, physics of failure models and then using uh, either the field-driven or current-driven uh, you know, the, the models to extrapolate to the time to failure of this uh, material and then um, exploring the operating conditions and then to map out these different operating condition with time to failures and then look at the design of this uh, uh, the in, in the integrated interconnector condition and then to have a material a reliability prediction map as you see from the uh, bottom left figure. So now the click Critical question over here is always the prediction accuracy because uh, we are limited in number of the trials in terms of the sampling and the experiment and also the the computational efforts. So uh, you know the we have discovered a very effective method to use the machine learning approach to help us to accelerate this failure identification process. As you can see on the right hand side, two figures. Essentially, if we do this. Uh, the, the sampling in the design space, essentially the only very few sample points will be sitting in the, uh, in the failure domain or majority of them in the safe domain. Now the question is how do we actually using uh, the tools uh, the, to help us identify those failure samples and without knowing the, actually the failure boundary or limit states over here. So we use the 
uh, machine learning guided tools to, to help us uh, uh, gradually adaptive sample of this space to quickly identify those uh, the video points are located in the in the uh, the uh, you know the limit state or the video boundaries as you can see on the right hand side of the figure with only limited few numbers of samples we are actually uh, quite effective identifying those uh, the video margin and then having leading to an accurate reliability prediction so next slide please Okay, so now when we come into the exploration of the material design, so we have these computational efforts that can help us with the prediction of the material property. And also we could have the experimental side to measurements from the, the experiments or accelerated reliability testing that generate the, the performance of the material and the different perspectives. Now the question is, is that we can only you know run few experiments or probably you know in the exploration of this uh, the design space we are not able to enumerate all the potential designs given that the space could be high dimension and and uh, the possibility of combination would be you know the a huge amount so now the right hand side figure the flow chart shows us a strategy that we will be adopting that we have this uh, red dot showing ex experimental samples and then the, the blue one showing as the computational ones. We use this uh, multi-fidelity adaptive surrogate modeling technique to fuse the information that mapping into the design space. And then we're only into the exploration of the design to conduct the experiment while, you know, the searching through the optimum while leaving out the majority of the space that we know for sure there's not going to be a good design over there. So by adopting this strategy, we can significantly at several magnitude level of, uh, you know, uh, the faster in terms of design exploration and the combining with the, the design strategies that the chin has presented, we will leverage the strengths on both computational and the experimental side for the for material design. We hope that build this as a simulation guided material design framework that can be applied not only just the, the, the you know, locate dielectrics, probably other materials of interest. Chin. Okay, so now deliverables. Uh, I think that uh, we outlined three of these uh, uh, deliverables. The first is the scalable process to fabricate nanoporous dielectrics with well-defined nanostructures. And then with that, we also provide a modeling framework to link the material property to essential, you know, the, the, the design, the, uh, you know, the alternatives, such as the structure of, of the nanoporous uh, dielectrics, and also quick reliability performance prediction too, to enable a fast discovery of materials while exploring, you know, a larger uh, design space. So with that, I think uh, that's our uh, the the presentation for Thrust One. Okay, thank thank you, Pingfeng. Um, mm -hmm. So we're gonna keep the fast pace. We're gonna now move to the second presentation. Um, so second presentation gonna be from Andre. So Andre gonna talk about a kind of interesting chemical vapor deposition methods. Hello, hello. Um, may I have a screen? Um, can you please allow me to share my screen? Yeah, you should be able to do it. Go ahead. Right. Oh, right. Uh, do you do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. I'm more than happy to describe to you a couple of high level ideas that we work on uh, regarding VOV photochemical processes for deposition and patterning. And I closely work with Professor Gary Eden, with Dane Sears and Jin Hong Kim. This is the core team that works on all the VOV photochemical processes uh, here at the EC department. So let me start with uh, just by telling you something that you all already know that uh, virtually all deposition and patterning processes, uh, I should probably say deposition, maybe skip patterning, uh, utilize thermal energy to initiate chemical reactions. So we use Arrhenius equation. So the basic idea is that we always deliver energy through heat to do processes such as deposition in order to um, 
dissociate precursors to deliver energy to atoms in order for them to find the best spot um, on the substrate and so forth. But um, our idea and uh, our approach is to actually use vacuum ultraviolet light. This is incoherent radiation from UV lamps. And this approach provides us a unique opportunity to drive all chemical reactions just by optical, uh, just by photons. So this means that those chemical reactions will be driven far away from equilibrium. However, this allows us to, to do really, really interesting things with materials. So there are a couple of advantages. First of all, it's really easy to localize photons, right? So instead of heating up the sample, you can actually eliminate specific parts of a wafer. So this is always a positive thing and it is extremely easy to control those uh, that you want to deliver to a sample. So we have optical sources. This means that the turn on and off times are on the order of microseconds. So you have very high precision of how much energy you deliver to the substrate to your surface. The processing times, I will give you a couple of examples in the end are extremely fast because uh, in our case, we don't need to use vacuum. We just use uh, nitrogen at atmospheric pressure to do all the processes. In thermal budget, so I'll just, I'll just give you a hint. We are able to deposit materials such as SiO2 at uh, room temperatures, which is obviously a huge advantage. And um, I believe uh, this is the first technique that allows deposition of SiO2 at room temperatures. So um, I'm talking about VUV. Let me just give you a very brief introduction of what I'm talking about. So every time I talk about VUV, I'll be talking about 172 nanometer photons. I'll explain in the next slide why we're worrying about this particular wavelength. But let me just tell you that 172 nanometers is equivalent to 7.2 EVs or 695 kilojoules per mole. Uh, which exceeds most of uh, bond energies for most molecules, meaning that this wavelength can actually initiate uh, chemical reactions and it's able to break most of chemical bonds. Uh, another uh, positive thing about it is that the absorption depth is really, really small. So you can deliver large amount of energies into a really thin layer of your material. Uh, why 172 nanometers? Why no one did this before? So just a very short story. Uh, this uh, 172 nanometer light sources have been developed in our lab. Uh, it's been probably 15 years since we started this development. And about five years ago in 2017, these light sources become available commercially. So these are actually have a, just a real light source here in my hands. So this is a 10 by 10, centimeter, uh, 10 by 10 centimeter light source. You see it's really thin, it's about four millimeters in thickness and it produces uniform light. Uh, uniformity is less than, uh, the intensity on uniformity is less than 3%, meaning that you can actually stack these light sources and eliminate really large areas. Uh, you can eliminate 300, 400, 500 millimeter wafers easily uh, using uniform uh, light at 172 nanometers they produce uh, 25 watts of average power from 10 by 10 uh, centimeters, which is equivalent to energy produced by decent XMR lasers. But remember, this is an incoherent light source. So we actually are fortunate that uh, these are really cheap sources compared to lasers. And the cost of one mole of photons in our case is extremely slower than for laser radiation. That's why we can actually utilize these photons to do photochemistry now. Okay, we developed a couple of exposure systems and they are distributed over our campus. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but we work with at least four or five labs and they are very happy with uh, uh, the performance. So let me arrive, uh, I'm arriving to the first application. Um, again, I'm just giving you a very high level um, idea of what we can do with 172 nanometer light sources. So the first application is photoablation of polymers, non-thermal ablation of polymers using light. So in simple words, you can take almost any polymer and it can be non-thermally removed in a dry fashion. Most of them are removed in a dry fashion with a very, very precise depth precision. 
So in the case of PMMA, uh, you can see this is a, just a space invader image of, uh, sorry, image of a space invader etched in PMMA. The depth is roughly 240 nanometers. It took us about one minute to do this etch. And the precision is roughly 10 nanometers or less. So we can really, really precisely remove polymers um, with 172 nanometer light. So this was done with contact photolithography, but uh, we can do projection as well. And uh, we will be able to do it in the future. Uh, in addition, you can actually do uh, th 3D patterning. So you can do uh, multiple photoablation processes, and they allow you to create really complex, uh, complex shape uh, structures, which may be used as optical elements or microfluidic uh, for microfluidic devices and so forth. So the key here, the key point I would like to deliver is that any polymer right now can serve as a photoresist. So we are not limited to, let's say, uh, just con conventional photoresist that have that requires uh, to be sensitive to specific wavelengths. Those may be actually functional polymers that you need to use for electronic devices, and you can ablate them really, really precisely and get any shape that you want for uh, these polymers. So we believe this is extremely important. Another uh, significant advantage is that uh, this is an environmentally friendly process. So this is just dry etching, right? You remove polymer by using light. You don't need any etchants. You don't produce any chemical waste and you don't use any chemicals for to do this. So this is one of the applications, but I think one of the most important applications that we've discovered is uh, the deposition of SiO2 from liquid TOs. So the process is pretty straightforward. Uh, we use TOs, spin coated on a sample, and eliminate it with 172 nanometer light. And uh, what you are able to produce is really high quality SiO2 films having thickness from, I think the lowest we had was 30 nanometers up to one micron at room temperature. So this process takes approximately 10 minutes or so to produce high quality SiO2 film on the entire wafer. And since this is a low temperature process, we're actually able to uh, coat organic materials. For example, on the uh, figure A, uh, figure E and F, you can see this is a PAT sample coated with SiO2. So in the past, it was impossible because SiO2 deposition requires really large temperatures, at least 400 C, to my best knowledge. You can use plasmas, but plasmas damage surface, so there are trade-offs. And this is, this is just a room temperature deposition of high quality SiO2. In addition, I'd like to add that uh, you can use it for planarization, as you can see from figures A and B. Um, we did some electrical tests. Uh, and uh, you can actually, so I would like to point uh, your attention to the right-hand side of the slide. So the breakdown voltage of a four, uh, 40 nanometer SiO2 film deposited 25 C is five, was measured to be five megavolts per centimeter. And this is a really impressive number for 25 C because the best, uh, that we were able to get with dry oxygen at 1000 C is 8.5 millivolts, uh, megavolts per centimeter. So this tells us that the films are actually high quality. They are dense, non-porous, and uh, our analysis show that though they are stoichiometric, so they are pure SiO2 films. You can obviously do um, temperature uh, thermal processing and just reduce, uh, sorry, improve characteristics of these um, films. But uh, the key point here is that this can be done at uh, 25C. Okay, so now, since we can do it at room temperature, why don't we use a PR and actually deposit pattern SiO2 on a wafer? So this, this is not the best image that we have, but uh, I think this is our first trial. But the key point is that you can use a PR. You can just pattern, just make any pattern that you want and deposit SiO2 through using a photoresist, which is amazing in our opinion, because 
um, this skips a couple of processing steps and allows you to do very fast deposition of uh, pattern structures. And uh, again, this is a an SEM of the first sample that we had. Again, that's uh, probably not the best quality, but the key point is the temperature and the fact that it is possible to deposit oxides at room temperatures using 172 nanometer light sources. So you deliver only optical energy, only photons are your main sources of energy to initiate chemical reactions. So we believe this is extremely powerful. So uh, our plan is we're actually playing a couple of experiments to do um, alumina, titanium, hafnia deposition at room temperatures, and hopefully to do multi-stacks of these materials in the future. Also, uh, we would like to try oxynitrides by just adding uh, nitrogen to our precursors, as well as making metal stable materials, which are impossible to produce uh, to date, because for example, SiO2 deposition requires 400 C, as I mentioned before, and uh, some, uh, uh, some shapes, some uh, phases of materials are just impossible to produce at high temperatures. However, this method would allow you to produce uh, those materials. And um, I would like to just summarize, again, this is just a very, very high level overview of what uh, we can do with VUV light sources. So the main advantage, the main advantages would be precise localization and control of dosage of VUV. So it's you can precisely control chemical reactions in specific places of your wafer if desired. This is a room, uh, this is a low temperature process, may be done at room temperature, maybe done at a bit higher temperatures, but still this is superior to all other processes. This helps to keep your thermal budget, budget really, really low. This also allows to deposit SiO2 and other oxides on polymers, which may actually be used for optical interconnects um, in the future. And uh, this is a really powerful technique in our opinion. The processing time and cost is extremely low. So I mentioned that it takes approximately five to 10 minutes to do processing of the entire wafer. And um, you can actually, if you're smart, you can reduce number of processing steps significantly by using these techniques. And uh, in the end, I would like to add that uh, they allow to reduce chemical waste significantly because you don't need to use DI water, don't need to use chemicals for etching in many cases. So uh, this is a huge benefit in our opinion. With this, I would like to end this presentation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to talk about this. Um, I can go as deep as you want, but I think uh, this is it for today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andre. Um, yeah, so we're gonna have the, the the final presentation today. So we're gonna have another group of faculties talking about using topological semi-metals as the metal interconnect. And after that, we're gonna have the floor open for the discussion and the Q&A for all three presentations at the same time. Okay, should I take the floor? <clears throat> Welcome everyone, my name is John Abelson. Let me call up our uh, slide deck. Uh, one moment here. Uh, so we have a, a group of uh, five investigators as you shall uh, see in a moment. And this group is really about uh, materials discovery uh, coupled with theory and properties. So Yingji Zhang, uh, my colleague in materials, an expert on transport for interconnects, myself and my long colleague, uh, Professor Greg Girolami, doing chemical vapor deposition. I do the deposition and kinetic control. Greg uh, synthesizes, invents and synthesizes new precursors, which are tailored to give the phase you want. Uh, we have Axel Hoffman, who will talk also about the use of topological semi-metals for magnetic applications, spintronics, and our colleague Andre Schliefer, the materials a theorist. So what we'd like to do is give you a couple slides each on these areas uh, to cover the groundwork of what this integrated team can do together. Now, Yingji, as it turns out, 
had an unmissable conflict. He's in a student PhD defense. Uh, so he has kindly agreed to uh, record his presentation in a couple of minutes. And uh, uh, I hope that's all right. One moment, let's make sure it can play for you here. Uh, sorry for the delay here. Ah, oh, yes, here we go. Let's see if I can make it play for you. All right, we propose to use topological semi-models for applications as elastical integral knocks. So the problem is uh, traditional metal integral knocks is that the resistivity increases a lot as line width becomes smaller down to the nano scale. And that's due to the random surface scattering effects in these materials. So to overcome this problem, we propose to use topological semi-models. And these materials have special surface momentum preservation effects. As a result, we can still achieve very high mobility surface states, even when we make them into nano structures and when these structures have lots of defects. So as a result, we can achieve the reverse scaling law. Basically, the resistivity can actually decrease as line width becomes smaller to the nano scale. So there are also existing literature reports that demonstrate uh, this concept. For example, in this uh, semi model, now BMR night, the bulk resistivity is around 30 micro ohm centimeter. And then as we uh, reduce the size to a nano belt structure, the resistivity actually become much smaller to only one micro ohm centimeter. So as room temperature, and this is actually even smaller than that of bulk copper, which is quite amazing. And for copper in contrast, the resistivity uh, increases a lot as we go from bulk to small nano structures. So those examples really demonstrate that topological semi models can be highly promising for applications as elastical interconnects. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me go back to our the rest of our uh, presentation here. So I'd like to uh, actually have uh, Andre uh, speak for a couple of minutes about what he brings here with theory. Andre? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so I would say the theory uh, can do two things in this, in this project. One is uh, that we usually, and that's what my group is doing in many other instances, we work closely with experimentalists in uh, understanding a specific material, right? So if, if experiment measures an optical spectrum, measures transport properties or electronic properties, we can run uh, first principle simulations alongside, which are parameter free and allow us to then understand uh, better what is seen in experiment. And the first two points on the slide briefly mentioned for maybe the experts in the room what methods we're using. So these are, uh, you know, quantum mechanical techniques uh, based on density functional and hybrid density functional theory, as well as many body perturbations theory to get accurate uh, data essentially for the electronic and optical properties. And transport then is, is studied using this Boltzmann transport equation approach, which, which allows us to include electron phonon scattering. Um, and the other way, uh, especially in the context of this project that we could use uh, theory here is that we could um, start from a sort of like exhaustive list of uh, topological semi-metals and use simulations to down select uh, maybe the experimentally most interesting candidate materials. Um, and I, I would say for now we're envisioning both of these modes of operation uh, to be used in this project. Now in terms of what insight we can gain, I, you know, I listed the one that I just mentioned as the third one. We can look at density of states and optics and transport. We can look at spin orbit coupling, uh, spin orbit torques. We can look at uh, disorder, and that is actually one of the things that my group is currently interested in. We are we are trying to understand the influence of uh, disorder, uh, temperature induced disorder in this case, on uh, optical properties in the context of these topological semi-metals. I think it would be very interesting to 
to study the effects of, of this uh, atomic disorder near the surface uh, and it, its resulting effect on the electronic and transport properties. And then we want to compare two experiments. So I think that the last point is true for all of our simulations. We, we run predictive theory, but we want to compare and, and, and discuss with experiment. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andre. We, of course, all of us will be available in the Q&A uh, section. I'd like now to speak about chemical vapor deposition of topological semi-metals. This is together with my colleague, Greg. Uh, and as I've mentioned, uh, Greg's great specialization is to design new molecules that give film growth at low temperature and give you high purity desired phases. And my role is to manipulate growth fluxes and we have, over the years, uh, introduced the use of inhibitors and diffusion-controlled growth with two reactants and directed fluxes. And what do we get? Conformal coverage, trench filling, ultra-smooth films, I mean on the sub-nanoscale, and area-selective deposition. Uh, this is a huge body of work. We published a critical work, critical review of almost 20 years' worth of work in this uh, citation. So let me here give uh, two examples of some relevance. On the left, some work we did under SRC support with Intel. Uh, this is filling a trench structure with a dielectric. You can see here on the lower left that in fact, the, uh, the growth is doing something impossible. It is super conformal. It's growing faster in the bottom than higher up. It forms a V shape, and then this V grows up and out of the material. So you can get uh, seam free growth. Uh, I will just allude to the fact that we're currently trying to do this with silicon nitride, and that involves some precursor magic uh, that Greg and his group are doing. On the right, a snapshot. This is work under NSF, both from DMR and CMMI, where we've introduced a a reversible inhibitor that creates area selective deposition. This is an SAO2 substrate. Here is an atomic force microscope image where you see nothing on the bare substrate. You see film nucleation in the absence of the inhibitor and in the presence of the inhibitor, it's just the bare substrate. Now, I mentioned this because we are very conscious of wanting to develop topological semi-metals, but to incorporate them in a realistic way in microelectronics fabrication. So these are interconnects, right? So we're going to have to fill trench uh, and via structures. If we can get other effects like area selectivity, that's fantastic. Now, what specifically can be done by this technique? We have only seen references to tungsten carbide and cadmium arsenide. Um, what we want to do is to deposit nanowires and films, including conformal films, at temperatures within a practical thermal budget. By the way, much less than 400 is really the target. We're going to start with something that is known, uh, tungsten carbide. We're going to use tungsten alkyl precursors. So start with something we are confident we can do. We're going to branch out to CBD of these phosphide phases. By the way, two of these are wild semi-metals and two are unconventional semi-metals. So we have here some bandwidth in the uh, physics of what we're looking at. And we have uh, an initial well-considered choice, amido or phosphido compounds for the metal source, phosphine or tert-butyl substituted phosphines as the phosphorus source. I want to pause and say I uh, also have a long background in sputtering. Why is it we don't just do things by sputtering? And one thing you'll appreciate is uh, if you are sputtering elements that cannot become volatile, it's extremely difficult to hit a specific phase composition. Suppose we were trying to do a three to two compound. If we miss the stoichiometry, then the film has excess atoms trapped in it. So when we do CBD, we always try to design a route where excess at the film forms and excess atoms leave 
in the gas phase uh, on some byproduct species. So we will grow uh, planar films uh, for our microanalysis. We will uh, make ribbons and fill trenches in order to look at that aspect of properties. And both uh, Ingi and myself will be responsible in various ways for the standard kinds of physical characterizations. Um, importantly, crucially, including resistivity as a function of thickness. Now, if I can change gears, I wanna turn the floor over to uh, our colleague, Axel Hoffman, to talk about use of these materials uh, in magnetic applications. Axel. Yeah, now I'm unmuted. Thank you, John. Um, so yeah, so one of the things about these topological semi-metals is the same kind of physics that makes them very attractive for these interconnects also makes them actually very attractive um, for, for magnetoelectronic or spintronic type of applications. Um, because these surface states are um, often um, related to strong spin orbit coupling and the strong spin momentum coupling um, in these materials. And so this is very useful because this provides then an electrical way for manipulating magnetic states. And this is known as spin orbit talks. And there's already a lot of developments of non-volatile magnetic memories where information is stored in magnetic states. And so this provides now a very energy efficient way how to manipulate uh, these talks. And, and the sample device structure you essentially see on the upper left. And it's already been demonstrated using spin orbit talks that you can get very distinct advantages, namely because the, the power is low, you can drive it at a very high overdrive, meaning that you can switch it very fast, you know, down to 200 picoseconds while still keeping power low, you know, about 130 picojoules. And this has been demonstrated with devices, you know, down to 60 nanometers. Another advantage over other electrical switching schemes is um, that due to the low power, um, it also has much higher endurance and it can be you know, switched much more often. And it is clear that the sweet spot for using spin orbit talks for these applications is really in topological materials. And this is what you see on, on the right hand side, which uh, shows a, a plot of the power consumption versus the spin orbit torque efficiency for different type of materials. Um, as has been discussed in great detail in, in the recent roadmap of spin orbit talks. And you see that topological insulators are populating all this area in the lower right part where we want to be. And um, while semi-metals so far have been just started to be explored for this purpose. So that's why they are not very prominently on, on this uh, plot yet. But essentially uh, they combine the benefits of topological insulators with these uh, surface states with strong spin orbit uh, uh, um, coupling. Um, and at the same time, provide rather low conductivities, as was uh, uh, John and Jingji already mentioned, is a benefit for, for interconnects. And so if we can go to the next uh, uh, slide. So our group is actually already exploring um, the use of, of uh, wild semi-metals for spin orbit talks. There are certain key interesting um, ideas about using wild semi-metals. One is, the uh, um, electronic properties are typically derived from the rather low crystal symmetries of these materials. And these low crystal symmetries also relax some of the restrictions that you typically have for spin orbit talks. So it allows to generate spin orbit talks um, with symmetries that you don't find in conventional materials. And this is especially uh, um, interesting because a, a big problem in magnetic switching is uh, switching magnetic materials that have magnetizations that are perpendicular to the layered structures where they're used in. And um, 
wild ceiling metals have something very attractive there to offer because they uh, specifically generate talks that allow you to do this. Furthermore, it's been shown that you don't need to have you know, uh, single crystalline materials to do this. Polycrystalline materials perform rather well. And so this has been shown in particular for, for tungsten ditalloate, um, mm -hmm. uh, where highly defective polycrystalline sputtered films were used for this purpose and, and they per perform you know, exceedingly well. Um, so our goal is really to um, look at which wild semi-metals are good for this purpose. And um, for example, use the type of materials um, that, that will be explored as part of this proposal, like the ones that, that, that John mentioned using uh, uh, the, the CBD, um, to then see um, what kind of, of spin transport properties we can expect from them. But you know, in parallel, complementary to that, we have um, a deposition chamber using a confocal sputtering system um, that allows us to deposit various elements at the same time. And so that allows us also to explore in great detail um, how different compositions uh, may give rise to different transport properties and spin transport properties. And some of the materials that we can easily think of that should have strong spin orbit coupling are materials like uh, uh, rhodium, silicide, aluminum, platinum, or platinum gallium. Um, but, but we're really open to a wide variety of materials that we could explore and, and possibly, you know, also guided by, by work done in Andre's group to narrow down the field of potential materials. And so if we go to the next slide. So my group has really a very long-standing expertise in characterizing spin transport properties in great detail. Um, we, we have developed uh, uh, new metrology tools for these uh, spin orbit talks um, early on. And so we have uh, two that are really the, the workhorse um, for, for uh, characterizing the, the uh, efficiency of mm. these electric uh, uh, spin talks. Uh, one is called spin talk ferromagnetic resonance, um, where we um, excite magnetization dynamics using gigahertz um, uh, 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 you know, mi microwave uh, um, excitations. Um, and the other one is called second harmonic hall measurements, which is a much lower frequency type of technique, but using essentially similar ideas. And in my group, we have um, a three-dimensional vector magnet that allows us to then explore exactly um, the symmetries of the spin torques. And so in particular, this allows us to identify you know, torques with, with novel symmetries, uh, which um, as I mentioned before, is, is a particularly interesting aspect about these uh, wild semi Um But beyond that, we can also then take the wild semi-metals, integrate them with, with a simple ferromagnetic layer and using a fairly straightforward uh, pulsed current magnetization switching uh, setup, we can do then statistical measurements that allow us to characterize device parameters that are really important for, uh, let's say memory application. So we, we can characterize in particular switching speeds, uh, switching currents, thermal stabilities, things like white error rates. Um, and this allows us to do you know, fast um, statistical um, analysis of, of these properties. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna save time by not having a summary slide. You've seen what our group can do. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, longstanding collaborations going here. And so we uh, turn it back to you, Ching and Shalu, for our next uh, portion of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, so to save the time, I think we're gonna just move to the Q&A and the discussion session. Um, so again, if you have any questions to any research team, uh, just uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat or you can speak out directly. But we're gonna start from uh, two questions from uh, uh, Hosono at uh, Samsung Electronics. 
Um, so the first question is about uh, the topological semi-metal for interconnect conductor applications, right? So Hasono's question is, well, we understand the low resistivity is necessary, but not sufficient condition. The ability to carry high current density is also very important. So specifically, the question is, in, in your opinion, how do the semi-metals compare with conventional metals like copper in the current carrying capacity in terms of like how many amperes per nanometer square? You know, I'll jump right in and say, I don't have data on that. Um, and so I think that's, uh, unless another team member does, I think it's part of the learning curve. I'll recall that for other technologies, uh, when issues came up, there had to be approaches like, right, uh, stuffing grain boundaries. Uh, to reduce electromigration during the electron wind. Uh, but frankly, that's that's not something that we can predict at this stage. Okay. Yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting question. Like we're going to do research under the framework of ASAP. Right. So another question also from Samsung is uh, about the CVD deposition of this topological semi-metals. So the question is, is there a process guideline or learning that can enable deposition of large grain films? without requiring extensive trail and errors for a given precursor chemistry? I'd like to field that one. Uh, we've, we've worked uh, in that area in, in recent years. There is no question that a, a backbone of experimentation is crucial because this process involves a chain of steps uh, from nucleation through growth at low temperature, we don't expect very much grain boundary motion during the growth process. I want to comment as part of our work on uh, both conformality and film smoothness, we have developed ways to control nucleation. And one can either go to very fine nucleation at the cost of small grain sizes to make a smooth film. We also have processes that can have relatively more sparse nucleation such that growth begins with isolated centers, this takes you in the direction of large grains. So um, a, a kind of unseen actor in a lot of CBD processes has been nucleation because until recently, you couldn't do much about it except maybe to pretreat the substrate. But we have additional molecules that we add dynamically. They do not break down and poison the film but which allow you to go to different limits of nucleation. And we have some papers showing the result. So um, can I guarantee large grain sizes? Not at this stage. Do we have experimental handles to manipulate it? Yes, we do. OK, thank you. Um, so any other questions uh, from, from our industry members? Um, can I make a quick comment? Uh, Ching, make sure that we are recording this portion because I know that um, um, several people have emailed me saying that um, they could not make it, but they had several questions. So perhaps we can also record the Q&A portion and share uh, depending on how the PIs feel about it. Yeah, it, it, it is sure. being recorded right now. Okay, no perfect. Thank you, thank you. Because I just got Nerissa's email saying she's traveling, so she wants to get a copy and all that. So thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, right. Any any other other questions about uh, uh, the research talks research to to topics we presented here regarding the material discovery for interconnects, or any specific you know request or your kind of major problems your face uh, and you, 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 you think it's gonna be a good opportunity for us to work together as a team to solve your problem. Uh, it, it's also gonna be a good opportunity to you, for you to share your problem with us. I had a question. This is uh, Joe Van Ostrom. Um, uh, for, uh, for John's talk, can the uh, topological semi-metals, can they be dry etched? Um, I haven't gone into that literature. <laughs> well, well I mean, you're replacing the dual damascene copper and you can't dry etch that. So we have to do all these other steps. And if you had a suitable 
substitution that could be dry etched, that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. and um, are you yes. interested in uh, uh, relatively larger quantities of etching or all the way down to the atomic layer etching for which one goes, as you know, to specific uh, schemes to replace the surface termination and then etch off the product? Right, right. Um, and this, actually all three talks, it's interesting, they sort of are blurring um, the lines between the front end and the back end, um, which is probably what your intentions were. Um, now, I mean, in the front end, I, we can run it at gigahertz, right? But in the back end, it's only tens of megahertz. Mm -hmm. So the industry would want to know how much better is, you know, the, um, you know, uh, Ching's porous um, dielectrics, uh, things like that. And, and mm -hmm. how much improvement would these uh, VUV photochemicals processing give you? And if you had, if you had all 13 metal layers, which ones would you be focusing on? Would you try and do all the way down to metals one, two, and three? Or would you just say, okay, after metal four, then you can use this and it's wonderful. Yeah, um, Jojo, thank you. Thank you for this, uh, for this excellent question. Um, so we, we don't have the time to get it covered, but one major purpose for us to have a center over here is really we break the boundary between you know, material science, electrical engineering, and the people working on the circuit and the architecture level. So specifically, you know, we have people like Shalu and then the Rash over here. So they're doing the, the, the device modeling all the way to kind of circuit design and architectures. So actually an integrated part we didn't talk over here is we're gonna have the, the architecture level simulation work, right? To really take the data we got from the material level and exactly to answer the question you just asked, like how are we gonna be able to you know, replace maybe certain parts right, of the back end of line interconnect structure with this new materials and what a specific like performance advantage we would expect compared to the incumbent uh, copper-based uh, interconnect technologies. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, I just have one last one. Um, if uh, Andre would consider adding uh, uh, tantalum and niobium to uh, his list of materials under investigation. Uh, they, they have interesting properties for memristors and if they could control that um, phase, that would be useful. Um, over, thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned, this is just, uh, we are right in the beginning. So we're definitely going to investigate uh, multiple materials. We just start with those which are most important for optics and for um, semiconductor industry. But sure, great comment, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question from the chat. Um, so it's from Teo uh, and the question is, could you comment on the potential and challenge of using 2D technology in interconnects, for example, the use of graphene? Um, well, I can briefly say about it. Uh, we're definitely aware of, uh, you know, there are a lot of work like people trying to use 2D materials like graphene as the diffusion barrier for copper-based interconnects. Um, so, um, well, whether that's gonna be successful or not, <laughs> we don't know. Um, but the purpose for this IUCRC center is really we're trying to do pre-competitive research, right? So for all the research, topics we, we talked over here, we're kind of looking at their maturity lifetime, you know, not in the next one or two years, we're looking at something, we'll probably be able to make, become a competitive technology in the time frame of five to 10 years. Um, so what, what we propose over here is kind of like, like a little bit of step beyond, right? Just the simply how, what, what type of material are we gonna replace titanium nitride, tantalum nitride as the diffusion barrier. Um, on the other hand, right, so we, we have this topological insulators, uh, topological metals um, project. So I believe they're also gonna, the 2D materials probably also gonna have uh, some promising position in that aspect as well. So, so John, do you have anything to add in that aspect? So Axel. No, not on this occasion. Yeah, I'll just quickly comment to you. Actually, that's a very good point. We do have some talks on 2D materials 
uh, probably not directly for the use in interconnects, but uh, um, in, in the case of um, you know, memory devices or some other types of uh, low power devices, which I think we will be presenting in our next two uh, webinars. So, Shalu, maybe I'd uh, interject a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry I came late to the conversation, uh, but uh, regardless of the materials uh, that you uh, might plan to explore in the context of the center, uh, I do think it's important that uh, even from modeling, the first principle modeling point of view, the actual characterization of the materials in the experimental work um, interfaces are going to be very critical, right? The conduction, the regardless of the conduction uh, the states or how, how conduction is happening and how we, those materials might come about to have a low resistivity, um, the interfaces are going to play a critical role, right? These are for, for either very narrow and thin lines and or in the VIA forms, all of those, the interfaces are tremendously important. So, so when you do consider these uh, studies and this material uh, exploration, please do it uh, from that point of view. Don't, don't stay too long on, on bulk or large area uh, structures that might end up misleading uh, uh, when you really go down to to the to be misleading when you go down to the to narrow or small uh, fissures. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Carlos, if I could just recall in our slides, uh, from the get-go, we propose making ribbons in trench fill because we want to push for the geometry and the dimensionality that really matters. But thank you. At what point will oh, it take him? Thank you so much. I, I, and again, my apologies. I, uh, it came late into the, into the meeting, so I might have missed that. But uh, I'm, I'm glad no you, you, you do factor that in. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Carlos, absolutely. I will be sending you uh, the slides and the recordings and all the materials. Uh, you make a very good point. And I think I now have a question. Um, sorry, uh, Axel, you showed us a plot for the um, for some of these materials, their spin hall angles. So how does one know what part of it is coming from the bulk, what's coming from the interface? Is there any studies from first principles that people have looked into for these systems, because I was told that looking at the interfaces between, you know, ferromagnet and the material is just very difficult um, from a first principles calculations, and perhaps Andre can also chip in uh, about that specific interface. Yeah, so so no, very, very interesting question. Um, so it's actually very, very hard to disentangle that experimentally. What is exactly bulk? What is interface? Um, and um, because by symmetry, you know, they, they are just similar. Um, you know, you, you can get some feeling for it by, by, by changing uh, thicknesses of your layers. And, and um, that gives you some, some inkling what is what. Um, now, to the earlier comment, you know, that, that the interface are important. Of course, um, that is true, um, but there's also some hope, of course, that, that with these topological materials, that these uh, interfacial properties are a little less dependent on the exact microstructure uh, than in ordinary materials. And, and so that's something that, that remains to be seen then as well. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from our audience? I think I can keep on asking questions, but I will not. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to Axel um, separately about this, but yeah. Yeah, okay. So if, if no additional questions from the audience, so thank you for your time. Thank you for your presence at this webinar. I think it's very successful. Uh, we're going to keep the conversation going. Um, just to bear in mind, right? So this is just a kind of showplace, like give you some idea about what our capability, what kind of interesting 
research and projects we will be able to do over here under the framework of ASAP Center. But on top of that, you know, but depending on your on your request, on your on your research needs, we can do more. Right? For example, the the characterization of the interface, you know, the, the transport properties. You know, we have world expertise. You know, working on looking at the material structures really with atomic resolution across the interface over here at UIUSA. We have experts. You know, really looking at the the interface properties for both electrical and thermal transport properties over here as well. So I would say the, the ASAP Center will give us a pretty good platform for us to grow our collaborations in the many more years to come. Okay, so thank you. Before we wrap up, I wanna say um, all our external people who are here, um, our next webinar will be on uh, 3D heterogeneous integration. So that would also be a lot of interesting talks on how we can put um, you know, photonics and electronics together. So that will be on March um, 9th, I believe, but I will send out a separate email to everyone. So thank you all for being here. Uh, it was really a pleasure to listen to all the fantastic talks and the comments. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank well, you. I'll stop the recording right now.